um, like a Mad Lib. And I'm sure you're all familiar with those. Maybe, maybe you did it when you were a kid or with your kids where you have a poem or something and uh, you don't let the person know what the poem is, you know. But you just ask for a noun, a verb, a color, whatever. And so my example was you could take Mary had a little lamb and have Fred had a giant goat or something like that. All right? Because you plug in the words randomly. So to do that, you need to know a couple of things. All right? To, to, to get this part done. First of all, you have to have Java installed and configured correctly. We talked a little bit about that last time, and I'm still willing to entertain questions about that. But secondly, you need to know how to randomize things. All right? So in other words, how to roll the dice and pick one of three choices or, or whatever. That's one thing you need to do. And the second thing you need to do is to be able to define a list or an array of items. So I'm going to kind of go, I'm obviously not going to do the assignment for you, but I'm kind of going to go in the direction of let's looking at randomizing stuff, let's look at outputting stuff, which we saw an example of in the Hello World app, but we're going to talk about that uh, in a little more detail. And then we'll talk about arrays and, and go from there. So that will be sort of um, the contents of today's class. All right, so let me go and open up my plain old text editor because unfortunately they don't have a card reader here, so no punch cards. I still regret that, but We'll go in here and I'm going to go and create my class and I'm just going to call it example. All right. So I'm going to call my class example. So what will the name of the file I'm going to store my class be then if the name of the class is example? Be example.java. And it should match the case. All right. So I'll start out by saying public class example. Now one thing I got in the habit of doing is putting the little braces. As soon as I put the one brace, I put the other brace. Um, that's one of these things that gets to be a nightmare to try to track down. Now I will say that some of the editors like Notepad++ does a nice job helping you figure that out. So. Um, is, that's still just a plain text editor, but it is useful in that regard. But I like to save myself that kind of grief, and, and as soon as I put the one in, I'll put the other one in. So we have defined our class. Looking for Norad? Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I, I think there's another class in there, so if some of my students came into that other class, at some point they should recognize it's a different person teaching them today than on Wednesday or on Monday and, and all that. So, yep, thank you. All right, so public simply means that the outside world can access it, which would be kind of goofy to have a private class in this context because then who could access it? No one could. And it's a class as opposed to something else, all right? Later on, we'll, uh, we'll study interfaces, which um, are different than classes, all right? So it's a public class, and its name is example. The braces show containment, so that shows that the class starts there and ends there. For the most part, you will have a one class per file. There are exceptions to that, but for the most part, one class is in one file. Now, one thing every Java application needs is a class that contains a main method or a main function. All right? And the function is always going to look like this. Public. Again, the outside world needs to access this. Static. We'll talk about what static means later in the semester, but the void method must be a static method. I'm sorry, the, the main method must be a static method. Void simply means that this method does not have a return value. 
functions can uh, have, have two things that are part of the function. Um, they have the arguments that they receive and they have the return value. So for example, I could create a sales tax method and the arguments to the method would be like the amount of the purchase. The return value would be the, the total amount of the sales tax. In this case, this main method doesn't return anything. So when something doesn't return anything, we say it's void. All right. Then we have the word main. And then we have in parentheses the possible arguments that you give to this method. We're not going to use these arguments, but we're going to put them in anyhow because the main event needs these arguments or the main method needs these arguments. Again, as soon as I put the one brace, I put the other brace in. So that's sort of the shell that all your classes, all your main classes, all your classes that you're going to run are going to look like. They're going to look like this. And last class we did the hello world. And the way that looked was something like this. System dot out dot print ln. And we said hello world. We close the quotes, close the parentheses, and end the line with a semicolon. Now, Java is case sensitive. What this is using is this is using a built-in class and method that's built into the Java language. It's built into the Java framework. Essentially, we are writing to the default output for this system, which is going to be the screen. So I'm going to save this. So we can recreate what we did last time and then we'll build on it to add randomization. So I'm going to go save and I'm going to save it on my desktop. I'm going to click all files because I want it to, I don't want to save it as a .txt file, I want to save it as a java.java .java file. So I'll type in example .java and save. And here we go. There it is. One thing that's a good idea to do when you're doing development is to show the file extensions. File names really consist of two parts, the name and the extension. And normally, at least on like the machines here on campus, they don't show the extension. But as developers, we really want to get into the nuts and bolts on this, so we want a full view of the situation. So in Windows 7, you go to Organize, Folder and Search Options, View, then you click off this Hide Extensions. Then it will show me, for example, that these sample pictures are .jpegs. All right. And it shows us that that example is a .java file. So let's get out and compile this. Okay, how are we going to compile this? I'm going to go to the command line. One way you can do it is by typing in CMD. Yeah. Okay. Repeat that, please. Running command line as administrator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but Different path. Different path. Yep. All right, there we go. I'm going to CD to the desktop. I'm currently in the instructor folder, so I do CD desktop. That takes me down to the desktop folder where my code is. And I compile it by typing in Java C example.java. It does its thing. 
And no news is good news. If I don't get an error message, it means it compiles. I can then execute it by typing in Java and the name of the class. And there I get the hello world. So this is what we did last time in reviewing that. Is there any questions about this part? What if you do have an error? Not out of luck. You just go, yeah, that's it, you quit. You get an error, yeah. yeah. So for example, in this case, if your case would be wrong, that would be one example of an error. One thing you can do, by the way, is you can use the up arrows to scroll through your most recent commands. So I compiled two commands ago. So if I hit up, up, it brings up the compile command. And I can hit return. And it gives me one error. And it tells you package system does not exist. We already know what the problem is, but again, Java being case sensitive, if you call something by one case, um, it won't recognize it if you don't use the correct case. So the system component is system with a capital S. Therefore, if I said, if I accidentally mistyped out, same sort of thing would happen. Can't find symbol out. All right. Another common thing, especially when you get into larger programs, larger classes and programs, is if you're not paying attention and you don't have like the right number of curly brackets. So let's get rid of that curly bracket. It says reached end of file while parsing. That's one of those things that if you know what it's trying to say, it makes sense. In other words, they hit the end of the file and it still didn't find something it was looking for. Well, what could it be looking for? It could be looking for anything that sort of ends a command or whatever. It could be looking for a parenthesis, could be looking for a quote, could be looking for whatever. So if it says it's reached the end of the file while parsing, you've left something out that it's expecting to see. And it hit the end of the file and it didn't see it, so it doesn't know what to do now. Is the number the line number? Yeah, it, it is a line number, but uh, all that is going to be is... That's like the last line in there. So it hit that. So in this particular case, the line number isn't meaningful. In the other case, let's go and let's put that back in. And let's spell this wrong. Line number is not shown in this case. Oh, yes, it is. Line 8. So in this case, yeah, that tells you it is on that line. What if I don't have a main method? If I spell main wrong. Oddly enough, it doesn't give me a compile error. Why doesn't it give me a compile error? Because we didn't try to run it yet. All right. There's two kinds of errors. There's compile errors and there's runtime errors. Compile errors make sure you fit the rules of the language. It has no idea that I wanted that to be the main method and I just spelled it wrong. For all it knows, that's a method that I actually want in the program. All right? What it doesn't know is I'm intending this class to be the class that I'm going to run. So it will only know that there's a problem when I go to run it. So if I go to run it now and type in Java example, that's where it says it needs a main method and it doesn't have it. So, I can fix that, and let me make sure I'm back where it's working before I try to move on. All right, there we go. 
Yes. Yeah, so in other words, each time through it creates a new class file. And that's a good point. In addition to the source file, there is a dot class file that contains this code translated into byte code. And remember, byte code is what the Java virtual machine actually executes. All right, so let's do some random number generating. All right, and let's output the value of a random number. I don't. Well, Andrew, one of you guys came in late, right? Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Here's a list of the Java primitive types. Okay? We'll talk about this more later. But a primitive type is a simple data type. And it has things, it is things such as a integer, which is represented by int. A long integer, which is long. A float. A double. A boolean, which is true or false. A string is not a primitive. And we'll talk more about what it means because there's some big implications about whether a data type is a primitive or a class reference, uh, a, a, an object reference. All right. But for now, we're going to stick with these primitives for, for the first part of this example. So I'm going to generate a random number. All right. And I'm going to output it. So I'm going to create a double precision integer. I'm going to call it random number. I'm going to generate the random number. And then I'm going to output it. How do I output it? Same way I did before. System dot out dot print ln random number. Now let's look at these three lines of code here. All right. Actually, I can get rid of those parentheses. Don't really need them. The first one I'm declaring the variable. Declaring a variable, declaring a primitive variable, allocates the memory for it, the computer memory for it. All right? Anything that's being operated on now has to be in the computer's memory. Now, we'll talk later about how the memory allocation is different between objects and primitives. But what this does is it creates a little box in memory that it's naming random number, and it expects me to put doubles into that. What are doubles? Doubles are simply high precision floating point numbers. So 3.89 can fit in a double. I don't know the exact range, but it's a big range of numbers. All right. Java is what is called a strongly typed language, which means that when you declare variables, you declare them for what they are. You can't simply have a var, a variant variable type, which you can in some other languages. For example, JavaScript. JavaScript, the variables don't have a type intrinsically associated with them. You can create a variable x and put a date in it, a string, a number, 
one right after the other, and it's not going to mind at all. Now you think, gee, that's great, all that flexibility. No, it isn't. All right? It's much better that you are forced to go through the process of defining this because then the compiler can notice if you've broken any of the rules. So if I try to stick a string in, into this double, all right, it's going to blow up. And it's going to blow up at compile time. All right? There's two kinds of errors that you can get in programming, generally speaking. Compile errors and runtime errors. Compile errors are the preferred because they stop you from going on until you fix it. All right? A runtime error is one of those things that you get where, well, if I, I'm supposed to type in my age here, but if I type in lyrics to a song instead, it blows up because it tries to do a, uh, a mathematical function on some words. All right? And it doesn't know. There's nothing in there that tells it that you can't put words in there. So you can put words in there until you try to do math on them. Then it blows up. Here, if I tried to put something that wasn't a double into there, it's going to blow up. All right. Random number. I'm going to use a random function on the math class to generate a random number. If you are really bored sometime, go and search how many different ways, ways to generate a random number. All right? You know, because really, you know, there's no such thing as a truly random number. It's generated algorithmically and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, uh, that makes sense if you're going for your PhD. But if you are writing a program that just wants to roll a six-sided dice and tell me if I got a one, two, three, four, five, or six, then we can use math.random. All right? And this simply prints it out. I could do this and put comments in here. Generally speaking, you want to avoid comments that simply restate what the command is doing. Rather, instead, you want to describe like what the reason why you're doing this now. So, like if this really was a dice that I was rolling, I would say, you know, roll the first dice. Dice or die or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. So I wouldn't just simply say, call the random function on the math class and store the result in random number. Yeah, that's what it does, but anyone that understands the language knows that's what it does. Your comment should reflect like why you're doing that instruction right now. All right, so let's go and save this and compile it. And it gives me this number, point blah, 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 blah. All right? Do it again, gives me a different number. Again, gives me a different number, and so on. Hmm. How are we going to make that? Let's say we want to roll a dice and get a, a die and get a one through six. How do I make that? You set a range. All right? Go ahead. Pardon me? There's probably a number of ways you can do it. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to multiply the answer by 6. Because this random method is going to give me a number from 0 to 0.9 repeating. Okay? So if I multiply it by 6, I'm going to get a number from 0 to almost 6. 5.9999 repeating. So that'll kind of get me there. All right? So I'm going to multiply it by 6. And oh, by the way, I'm going to say, you rolled a, just do a little plus sign there, so I get a full message. So 
I'll go and save this. Compile it. You rolled a 0 0.83. You rolled a 0 0.37. You rolled a 1.48. Yeah, interesting dice. All right. Some kind of multi-dimensional thing going where you can get fractional or quantum theory where the probability. So one of the things that you notice is that the numbers can go, the integer part of the number can start with zero. All right? And really what I want is I want this to be an integer. Right? I don't want to have a floating point number. I want to have an integer number. So let's go and change this to an integer. All right? So I'm going to make it an int. So I'm, I shouldn't get then those goofy answers. All right? And I should put a space after A. All right. Ooh, I get an error. Invalid or incompatible types. Possible lossy conversion to int. What does that mean? Yeah, it means that it's giving you, I might lose some data. That's what lossy means. It means that you might lose some data as you go and compress, uh, or as you go and as you try to put that in there. That's actually good news for me that I got this compile error. Because who would want a program where you could roll a 1.5739 on your dice, right? This is telling me that I'm doing something wrong. All right, so it's good that I get a compiler. What I have to do, essentially, is I have to tell the compiler, yeah, I know that the random number actually gives me a floating point number, a double. Let's convert it to integer. Let's treat it as though it was integer. And let's take just the integer part of it. So I can do that by saying int. Here, int in parentheses. Does anyone know the term for that? That is casting. Casting is where you have uh, some data that can be treated several different ways, and you define how you want to treat it in this case. Yeah, this is a floating point number, but I want to treat it like it's an integer, so let's ignore the decimal parts. All right? So now, we should get a compile. Oops. I rolled a zero. Oops. I rolled a seven, a zero, a zero, a zero. What I do wrong? but it's always coming up zero. That's kind of suspicious. Probably need this guy in parentheses because it's probably turning that into an integer and then multiplying it by six. There we go. There we go. We rolled a three. Whoops. Keep compiling it. Rolled a zero, rolled a zero, rolled a five, rolled a four. All right, that looks a little more reasonable. All right, now if this were a dice or a die, right, we should just pass a law to say I can call it a dice. If this is a die, we're getting numbers from zero to five. How could we change it to be from one to six? Just add one. So assuming this is a die, I would just go in here and say, Change that to an integer and add one to it. Did anyone else hear that? <laughs> what was it? All right, so now it should, if we look,
Give me a number from 1 through 6. And it gave me a 1 through 6. There we go. Yeah. All right. So, we got it doing a dice. And we could expand that and so on and so forth. But what we want to use a random number for is something different, right? We want to use random number to pick an element in a, in a list or in an array. All right? Some variables such as this, it's a primitive, it's an integer, but it only contains one value. All right? Only can contain one value at a time. But if we think of our Mad Lib and Mary had a little lamb and so on and so forth, we want to have a list of values to choose from. So let's change the rules a little bit on this one. Let's say that I am writing code that tells me if I drew a heart, spade, club, or diamond from a deck of cards. All we're going to do is say it's a heart, a spade, a club, or a diamond. One of those four possibilities. All right, so one way we could do this, and again, many or most of you have had C sharp, is we could generate the random number and then test and say, if I drew a one, that means clubs. If I drew a two, that means spades. If I drew a three, that means hearts. Drew a four, means diamonds. We could do that. However, a much simpler way to do that would be to create a list, an array and say, if I drew a 1, give me the first element from that list. If I drew a 2, give me the second element from that list. Except for one slight detail. You don't start numbering with 1, 2, 3, and 4. You start numbering with 0. So the first element of the list is item number 0. The second element is item number 1. The third part is item number 2. So we want to get rid of this plus 1. And I want to generate a number between 0 and 3. So I'll multiply that by 4. All right? Because that random part is going to give me a number from 0 to almost 1. So if I multiply 0 by 4, I get 0. If I multiply almost 1 by 4, I'm going to get almost 4. In other words, 3 point something. All right, so this will give me a number between 0 and 3. All right, so I'm going to declare my array of string values. The braces like that indicate that this is an array. And I can go in here and say hearts, oops, diamonds, clubs, and spades. Yes. Doesn't matter. If you put a space between string and this bracket, it would still work. OK. So now we have suits, which are hearts, diamonds, clubs. This is element 0. This is element 1. This is element 2. This is element 3. So now, we don't want to display the random number, right? We want to display the number, or we want to display the element of the array that corresponds to that number. Actually, why not? We can display both of them. We can display both of them just to prove to ourselves that it works. 
that if they drew a zero, that they get hearts. If they drew a one, they get diamonds, and so on. How do you refer to an element of the array? By giving the array name. And then in brackets, the value of the subscript. So random numbers should have a value of 0 through 3. So I should get a 0 through 3 for the first display. The second display should show me the name of the suit that corresponds to that number, whether it be hearts, diamonds, clubs, or spades. All right. So let's save this and compile it. Error. Semicolon expected on line 8. That is going to be the most clear error message you're going to see ever. I forgot a semicolon at the end of line 8. Which almost begs the question, if you knew a semicolon was supposed to be there, why did you complain about it? Why didn't you just take care of it for me? That's not how it works, right. You know, it doesn't know if you left the semicolon out because you intended something else or because you just um, were tired and it's the first week of classes and you got confused for a second. All right, so now we'll go and compile it and it'll work. And when we run it, it says one diamonds. Is that right? Yes. One corresponds to diamonds. Three spades, and I assume that's right as well. Yes? We'll display all of them. That being said, when you correct another error, another, it will display all of them that it can. That being said, one error could keep the compiler from maybe finishing an entire class, so when you correct one error, you may see other errors later on. But it will display all of them that it's aware of. So like, for example, here, if I make both of these wrong, give me two errors. Now again, that's not to say there won't be a case that there'll be such a bad error that the compiler throws its arms up and gives up, and it displays that error and doesn't go any further with a particular file. So if you fix that, you might get other errors, but as a general rule, it will give you as many errors as it can. All right. Very good. Let's go and let's make this so that we're not just drawing a suit. We're drawing a card. Okay? So, we could do this a bunch of different ways. I'm going to do it this way. Because cards generally go 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, Jack, King, Queen, Ace. Why am I making these strings? Because some of the cards have characters in them, so I have to make all of them strings. Should have picked a pinochle deck instead, doesn't it? <laughs> That'd be less typing. All right, there we go. Semicolon, very good. All right, how's this going to work? Well, 
We're going to declare another random number. What do we want this random number to hold? Right, the element of the card suit. And, and what values are legit for that? How many values are there? Two, three, four, there's 13 of them. There's 0 through 12. So, I'm going to have a statement that looks like this. Random number 2 equals math random times 13. That will give me a number from 0 through 12. I can then output that number. And I can use it to display Yeah, that would be nice. Let's do that. All right, I think that will do it for me. One way to find out, go and compile it. And test it. Jack of diamonds. I don't know why I compiled it again. Six of hearts. Well, you chose zero and four. What's zero? That's the first suit in the array list. Four is the fourth card in the uh, card list. So one, two, three, or zero, one, two, three, four. All right. Almost had me there for a second. Now, one thing I want to talk about in, in this class, and I talk about it in all my classes, is the notion of refactoring. In other words, you do something, you get it to work. If my job was to randomly generate a card, I've done that. The question is, is can I do a better job at it? And you know what? The answer is almost always yes. All right? Now, there's other factors in the real world. How hard your boss is screaming at you to get this finished, all right, would be one of them. What, the, what your budget is to get this finished, how much time you have allocated. But from a theoretical or pure programming perspective, there's almost always ways that you can improve it. All right? Here's one way you can improve it. And improving it often takes the form of what if something about the rules change? How easy will it be to correct it? So, for example, I have hard coded in here 4 and 13. All right? What if I wanted to do a pinochle deck which has what? It, it only goes, what, nine through aces? Something like that. There's a there's fewer number of cards. Or what if someone invents a card game where there's a fifth suit, for example? Use the length of the array. Because in this case, the length of the array is four, which matches that. Length of this is 13. So how do I determine the length of the array? I simply say, the name of the array dot length. Now, this points out something that we will talk about more in future classes. But notice a couple things about this. Notice, first of all, string starts with a capital S and int starts with a lowercase i. Is that just a coincidence? No, it isn't. 
String is actually a, a class. All right. So when I declare that, I'm not declaring a primitive variable. I'm declaring a class variable. All right. Or, or an object variable. Yes. And there are methods to it, and there are attributes to it. One of those attributes is dot length. So by doing this, I'm saying, hey, this array called cards is an array of strings. I am getting the attribute for the length of that array. All right? So it's an array of strings. One of the characteristics of it is an attribute. Primitives don't have attributes and methods like that. Primitives just have their value. A Boolean is just a Boolean. It's true or it's false. An integer is just an integer. An array, though, is an object that we can ask questions to. How many elements are in there? You know, and so on. So for these more complex data types, these object references, they're going to have methods and they're going to have properties. And in this case, length is that. And this should still work the same. All right. And it has the advantage that if I added a joker, for example, not that there's a suit, a joker of hearts or whatever, I don't think anyhow. But if I added an extra card in there or a pinochle deck which has less cards or whatever, then that will accommodate it without me having to change the code. So the less you have to do when something changes, the better your code is. And in this case, if I add another suit, all I have to do is add it to that array and the rest falls into place. I would think you have enough to do the Mad Libs now. All right. The next logical question or, or a logical question that we'll address in, in upcoming weeks, I have to look at uh, the plans for this uh, course. But yeah, we're doing all this with cards now, but we could have a bunch of different games that play cards. We have a bunch of different programs that use cards. Would I have to duplicate this kind of stuff in every one of those games? And the answer is I sure hope not. All right? And that will lead us into our discussion of classes and objects and so on. So I don't know if we'll talk about that next week or not. I have to check the schedule. Question? Such as? Well, on this one, there, there should really be no validation because if you do everything correctly, um, you're basing the random number on the length of the array, and therefore, it, it should always be right. Um, for this, you know, one class per file, your class name matching the name of the, uh, of the file name. Um, classes should start with capital letters. All right. Method should start with lowercase letters. And variables should you uh, both variables and methods should use what they call the camel case where the first character of the whole thing is lowercase and then each subsequent word is uppercase. I'm not saying I'll necessarily deduct for those, but those are good practice to to follow. Yes. What do you mean by parsing? It does some implicit conversions for you. So for example, in this case, we do do a little bit of, of um, um, casting to say I want to treat this like an integer. But here, this is an integer, this is a string. The Java compiler is kind enough for you to sort of do that implicit conversion. So no, you don't have to do a change it to string. Other questions? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I didn't put the hello world one because part of what I wanted you to do was go in and find your own. But I'll, I'll put this one out there. Absolutely. Other questions?
Well, I, I don't. I don't want to say this without without sounding like a wise guy. We're not writing C or C sharp, so it, what you can do in there is irrelevant here. Does Java? Does Java have something comparable? It might. I mean, look up Java random number and you'll see a million different ways to do that. It's telling you not to do that because you use integers. We took care of that. Use a random generates within uh, a range. Um, yeah, this shows you how to do that. This doesn't seem any simpler than doing that way. You don't have to import the map library? No. They do it here, but that's a two-step process. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things that, like, yeah, it'd be nice if you could do that, but, you know, once you sort of, like, know how to do it, then it's really not that big a deal to just remember to multiply it. And remember, whatever you're multiplying it to, you're getting one less than that. So if you multiply by six, you're going to get a number that stops at five. Other questions? All right, let me upload this, and we'll see you up in lab.